Hello everyone and welcome back to the economic survey lecture series. This is our lecture number 7 and the final lecture in the current series to cover economic survey 2021-22. In this lecture, we are going to cover two very crucial areas which have been mentioned in the economic survey. One is related to fiscal policy and the second one is related to monetary policy, banking and finance. As we have done with the rest of the topics, before we start the detailed discussion of the topic, let us have an overview of what we are going to study. So we are going to study chapter number two, which is fiscal developments. And this is chapter number four, which says monetary management and financial intermediation. So friends, this is the chapter plan for you. And we are going to discuss fiscal and monetary policy according to this chapter plan. You know, guys, COVID was a unique crisis. Why? Because it started like a health crisis and very soon it got converted into both health and economic crisis. To control such a vast scale of crisis, the governments across the world followed an integrated approach whereby they used both fiscal and monetary policy to reduce the impact of COVID-related crisis. Government of India was no exception. We also followed an integrated approach of fiscal as well as monetary policy for the following purposes. Number one, to control the impact of COVID. Number two, to take care of our vulnerable section of the society. And number three, to revive economic growth. Now, how did we do that? In what phases did we do it? So let us begin to understand the overall perspective of crisis management in India in last two years. You see, crisis management <clears throat> typically comprises of two approaches. One is called fiscal policy. Second is called as monetary policy. Under monetary policy, the Reserve Bank of India tried to make sure that enough liquidity is available for different sections of the society. How does RBI make sure that there is enough liquidity in the economy? So RBI uses CRR, SLR, repo rate, open market operation, reverse repo rate and LTRO. These are some of the tools that Reserve Bank of India uses to promote liquidity in the economy. In fact, the liquidity management policy of RBI went through two phases. In the first phase of liquidity management, RBI tried to increase the liquidity in the economy. In the second phase, RBI tried to reduce the liquidity a little bit. These are the two phases that we saw in the Indian economy to control crisis. In terms of fiscal policy, there were four phases of fiscal policy which was used in India. In the first phase of the fiscal policy, the government of India tried to make sure that we take care of the vulnerable section of the society, including the migrants who were returning back home. In the first phase, the government of India also made sure that we take care of the MSME sector because MSME sector takes care of a lot of employment in the economy. In phase two, the government of India's main intention was to improve aggregate demand in the economy so that consumers would spend. Because if you start to promote aggregate demand and, and resume consumer spending in the economy, then economy returns back to its normal motion. In the third phase, the government of India paid attention to increasing private sector investment in the economy. So see, on one hand, Reserve Bank of India was you know, putting liquidity in the system. On the other hand, government of India was giving incentive to our industries to use that liquidity for investment purposes. Government of India was also promoting infrastructure creation and capital expenditure in the economy. So when you take care of industries, industrial sector and when you incentivize industries to increase their production by giving them better infrastructure, by giving them easy liquidity, aggregate supply in the economy increases because who supplies goods and services in the economy? Industrial sector and service sector. And who creates demand? Consumers. <clears throat> so consumers were creating demand and government of India was also promoting supply. So when supply and demand both increase, then your GDP increases, employment creation takes place. This is the approach that we followed. In the fourth phase of fiscal policy, the government of India carried on with what it was doing earlier. In the fourth phase, the government of India 
promoted more capital expenditure. What is capital expenditure? Expenditure in construction of infrastructure like roads, like you know, national highways, seaport, airport, railway, all these things are capital expenditure. In that context, let us have a look at the trend in the capital expenditure in India. You see, during the lockdown phase, the capital expenditure was low. But once the first wave was over, the government of India pushed for the capital expenditure and see how rapidly it increased. But then we had the second wave of COVID. Because of that, we saw that there was a dip in the capital expenditure. But again, the government of India is pushing for it and the capital expenditure is going up. In the current budget also, the government of India has emphasized that the capital expenditure is going to be the focal point of government policy for increasing India's GDP. In fact, in this stage, phase four, four, which is going on, the government of India is also pushing many infrastructure related schemes, for example, national infrastructure pipeline, under which the number of projects have increased up to 7,400 now. Earlier, it was in the range of 6,000 something projects, but now it is almost 7,400 products. Now, government of India <coughs> has also increase the coverage of production linked incentive scheme. This scheme is very important because this scheme is helping the industries to invest more in research and development, create better products and not only help in the supply of products in the domestic economy, but also to export goods that have been manufactured in India across the world. So government of India is bringing more industries under production linked incentive scheme. So a combination of fiscal and monetary policy has been used by government of India as a tool for crisis management. So guys, the best way to understand the fiscal condition or the health of the government of India is to look at this flowchart which shows the government budget. Now government budget comprises of two components. The first is revenue budget and the second is capital budget. Revenue budget talks about the day to day or recurring which means normal expenditure of the government of India and normal income of the government of India. Similarly, capital budget talks about how the government of India creates assets and how the government of India suffers from liabilities. So these two things are discussed in capital budget. Now let us look at some of the components of revenue budget and capital budget and then see whether the components are showing something positive or negative about India. So if we start with the revenue budget, we will see that revenue budget has two components. First is revenue receipt and second is revenue expenditure. Revenue receipt means those sources from which government of India gets income or revenue on a regular basis. And revenue expenditure means those expenditures which the government of India incurs on a regular basis and which are recurring in nature. So let us look at some of the revenue receipts of government of India. The revenue receipt of government of India comprises of two kinds of revenue receipts. First is tax related revenue and second is non tax related revenue. As we can see tax related revenue has two parts. First is direct taxes. Second is indirect taxes. So may I ask you a question out of India's total tax collection. What is the contribution of direct taxes and what is the contribution of indirect taxes? I will answer this question, don't worry. Uh, we will discuss this question in a minute. But before that, let me tell you some details related to the taxes. So the tax revenue of government of India comprises of direct taxes like corporate tax and income tax, indirect taxes like custom duties, excise duties, union excise duty and GST. If you look at the trend, the corporate taxes increased in India in 2021 compared to the previous year. Why? because of increase in profit, because of more formalization in the economy. All right, so and plus the tax compliance by the corporate sector also increased, which means corporate sector was paying more taxes. Income taxes also increased. Similarly, the custom duties increased in India because we were importing more items. Why did excise duty increase in India? Excise duty increased in India because during COVID lockdown phase, the global oil prices were down. So India imports a lot of crude petroleum, crude oil. So government of India increased the excise duty on the 
पेट्रोल एंड डीजल इन इंडिया और राइट बिकॉज ऑफ दैट आवर एक्साइज ड्यूटी इंक्रीज नाउ जी एस टी इंक्रीज बिकॉज जी एस टी टैक्स कलेक्शन वेन द लॉकडाउन सिचुएशन स्टार्टेड टू इम्प्रूव द इकोनॉमिक रिवाइवल स्टार्टेड टू हैपन एंड वी सॉ दैट द जी एस टी कलेक्शन स्लोली स्टार्टेड टू इम्प्रूव नाउ लेट एस हैव अ लुक एट द नॉन टैक्स रिसीट ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इन टर्म्स ऑफ नॉन टैक्स रिसीट द फर्स्ट कॉम्पोनेंट इज इंटरेस्ट ऑन लोन वेन गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया प्रोवाइड्स लोन इट रिसीव इंटरेस्ट दैट इंटरेस्ट केम डाउन now profit of public sector units when the economic revival started after the lockdown was over the profit of public sector enterprises started to go up the receipt of government of india against the services that it provides you know the government of india provides services like health education and against which the government of india receives income that income actually came down now reserve bank of india transfers surplus to government of india that surplus increased you know the transfer of surplus from reserve bank of india to the government plus the profit of public sector enterprises it was decent last year and because of that the non tax revenue of the government of india was good now let us come to the revenue expenditure of government of india revenue expenditure of government of india would include defense expenditure that increased now pension and salaries that came down actually why did the wages and and pensions came down in government of india now it came down because the new hiring or appointment by government of india during covid phase was low plus government of india also provides dearness allowance to the government employees what is dearness allowance which is called as da whenever there is inflation the government of india provides compensation to the government employees in terms of salary increment to compensate them against inflation so that was not provided because of covid situation the finances of the government of india was not that great hence the wages salaries and the pensions that came down now interest payment by government of india increase whenever government takes loan government has to pay interest so that interest payment increase because we took a lot of loan due to covid you know this particular thing called subsidy that increased in india now <clears throat> you know that we have something called as national food security act under which we provide subsidized food to our population because of covid the situation became really very difficult because a lot of vulnerable section of our society including those people who were returning from cities and towns called as reverse migration because sometimes they did not have access to even basic necessities of life like food like medicine etc so the government of india started pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana under which over and above national food security act in addition to it the government of india started to distribute free food grains to people so if you look at the revenue expenditure 60% of the increase in revenue expenditure was because of subsidy and a major part of that subsidy was related to food subsidy so this is the story of revenue expenditure if we come to capital budget we will see that there are two parts under it first is capital receipt and second is capital expenditure the capital receipt is of two types so the government of india receives capital in two different ways one for example by borrowing so suppose i am government of india and i sell government bonds so when government of india sells government bond government of india will get capital but this is the capital which government of india has to return right so this is called as debt creating capital receipt because government of india has to return it it's a liability so whenever government borrows from the market like for example by selling bond the government has to return it the an, another type of capital receipt is called as non debt creating capital receipt so for example government of india has given loan to somebody and government of india recovers the loan so we don't have to return it right because it's our money so that is called non debt creating similarly when government of india sells public sector enterprises called as disinvestment or government of india privatizes them the government of india receives capital which we don't have to return so that is also called as non debt creating capital receipt the target for you know a disinvestment by the government of india was rupees 1.7 lakh crore government of india wanted 
to raise this much of capital through disinvestment but the actual realization was 9330 crore only there is a huge gap between what we wanted and what we achieved in terms of disinvestment now if you look at capital expenditure so government of india has spent in defense equipments for example similarly government of india provides central government provides loan to the state governments that is also called a capital expenditure right similarly the government of india also acquires assets like buildings bridges and and machines and equipments and all those things that is also called as capital expenditure so now we are back to that question which i asked you that what is the contribution of direct taxes and what is the contribution of indirect taxes in india's revenue so let us have a look at it you see if you look at the composition of the tax revenue of government of india you would find something very interesting see what is the contribution of for example corporation tax the taxes which the corporates pay 25% out of india's total tax collection 25% is the contribution of corporation taxes similarly the tax income taxes what is the contribution of income taxes in india's total tax collection see around 25% these two are called as direct taxes so what is the contribution of direct taxes 50% in our tax collection what is the contribution of excise duty c excise duty what is the contribution of gst c and what is the contribution of customs so if you add these three this comes out to be 50% so the contribution of both direct and indirect taxes is roughly equal now 50% 50% this can be asked in upsc now let's have a look at one important figure which uh, i have taken from economic survey this is about tax to gdp ratio so <clears throat> we are going to look at tax to gdp ratio you know whenever gdp of a country increases a country like india we expect that our tax collection will also go up whenever tax collection goes up it is expected that government of india will use that money for public welfare and welfare schemes and to create infrastructure so this ratio is very important if you look at this ratio around 2017 18 it was 10.7% 2018 19 it increased to 10.9% 2019 20 percent we know 2019 20 was a slow down phase for india now if you look at 20 20 21 it was again increasing 10.2% 2021 22 so 9.9% so clearly we see that tax to gdp ratio has come down so guys now let us have a detailed uh, you know overview of what is the current disinvestment policy by government of india you see the new disinvestment policy by government of india was announced under atmanirbhar bharat on 4th of february 2021 see according to this Uh, you know department of investment and public asset management they released this new policy as per this new policy related to disinvestment the you know public sector enterprises would be divided under two different categories one would be called as strategic sector one would be called as non strategic sector now what is strategic sector what is non strategic sector so the government of india has said that there are four strategic sectors number one atomic energy space and defense transport and telecommunication power petroleum coal and minerals banking insurance and financial services the government of india decides the list of strategic sector based on our security based on economic concerns and so many other parameters so these are the strategic sectors so the government of india has said that in these strategic sectors the number of public sector enterprises would be minimum but yes there would definitely be public sector enterprises in these sectors rest all other sectors are called as non strategic sectors and in non strategic sectors the government of india has said that the public sector enterprises will be either privatized or it will be shut down so there will be minimum presence in the strategic sectors in the non strategic sector the government of india would not exist all right now who would decide what is strategic and what is non strategic it would be decided based on the recommendations of niti aayog there is a third category as well 
about which the government of India has not given a name, but yes, that category exists. What is that category? So that category is outside the scope of this policy. For example, if you look at our ports, if you look at some public sector enterprises which are working for vulnerable section of the society or which are working for the betterment of the farmers. So if such a public sector enterprise exists, the government of India is not going to you know, do anything related to those public sector enterprises, they would continue to perform their role. The government of India is not going to put them either in strategic or non-strategic. These kind of public sector enterprises, which is working for vulnerable section or farmer or, or, they, or they are taking care of our ports. So they would continue their normal operations. This is the current approach. Now, you see, what is the target that we had kept for disinvestment in 2021-22 as we had discussed few minutes back. The target was 1,75,000 crore. This is the capital that the government of India wanted to raise through disinvestment. But what did we do? We raised 9,330 crores based on the disinvestment. So we are well behind our target. Now having looked at the disinvestment policy, let's come back to this budget and let us try to understand some important areas related to budget. For example, if you look at this budget flowchart and if somebody would ask you, what is the total income of government of India? How would you answer that question? The total income of government of India or total revenue of government of India would be revenue receipt plus capital receipt. You have to add this and this. If somebody would ask you, what is the total expenditure by government of India? We would say revenue expenditure and capital expenditure. Now, if you remember, I told you that the meaning of revenue budget is day-to-day -day sources of earning and day-to-day -day expenditure of government of India. So, for example, suppose if the day-to-day -day expenditure of government of India is more than day-to-day -day income, which means revenue expenditure is more than revenue receipt. Would that be a good scenario? No. So whenever revenue expenditure is more than revenue receipt, we call it as revenue deficit, which means the government of India is not able to sustain even its day-to-day -day expenditure. That is called as revenue deficit. Similarly, there are other deficits called as fiscal deficit, primary deficit, you know, effective revenue deficit. Let us look at some of the budgetary deficits and let us see what is their situation in India currently, because it would give us an idea about the health of the government finances. So guys, these are the budgetary deficits. I have already explained what is revenue deficit. So revenue expenditure minus revenue receipt. Sometimes the government of India spends money to create some capital assets. For example, construction of a road, etc, etc, which is a good expenditure. So out of our revenue deficit, if we remove the grants for creation of capital assets, so out of revenue deficit, if you remove the grant for creation of capital asset, we will get something called as effective revenue deficit. Now, there is something called as fiscal deficit. What is fiscal deficit? Fiscal deficit, actually, in very simple terms, fiscal deficit would mean the borrowings by government of India. And when would a government borrow? A government would borrow if its expenditure is more than its revenue. So fiscal deficit is equal to total expenditure minus revenue receipt, plus non-debt creating capital receipt, right? So revenue receipt minus non-debt creating capital receipt. So whatever is left is called as the borrowings of the government of India. So fiscal deficit is like borrowings. What is primary deficit? You know, for example, last year the government of India borrowed money. When the government of India borrowed money, now the government of India has to pay interest. So when we remove the interest component, from fiscal deficit, all right? So if you remove the interest payment on the previous borrowing, so whatever government of India borrowed last year, we have to pay interest on that. So if you remove that interest rate from fiscal deficit, we get primary deficit. So these are some of the budgetary deficit. Now, let us have a look at what their situation in India is currently. So revenue deficit, effective revenue deficit, fiscal deficit and primary deficit. The government of India wants to keep the deficits at low level. See, whenever you use the word deficit, that means there is a shortage. So we don't want to continue with the shortage, we want to keep it low. Now in 2020-21, all right, so you see, 
7.3% revenue deficit. Now it's improving 4.7, 2022, 20, 23. This is uh, budgetary estimate. We estimate that it will be 3.8. So it is going to improve. Effective revenue deficit is also going to improve. Similarly, fiscal deficit 9.2 to 6.9. It was high here because of COVID, uh, similar situation. And now we are saying that we will control it to 6.4. Still, it is very high because of COVID. Government's borrowings are high. Now, primary deficit 5.8, 3.3 and 2.8. The government of India also wants to keep it low. So now we are going to study what is the position of general government finances. You see, general government finances would mean the finances of the central government and the finances of the state government. So let us start with the central government. Uh, so, so the first thing that we are going to do is central government debt. You know, what is the meaning of the debt of the central government? Debt of the central government means all the liabilities. Liabilities means that whenever central government arranges, uh, you know, capital or resources, and if they have to return it, that is called as the liability. So central government debt means all the liabilities of the central government, which the government has to return. So the, all the liabilities of the central government can be divided majorly into two categories. The first is called as public debt and the second is called as other liabilities. What is the meaning of public debt? Now public debt is of two types. The first is called internal debt. Second is called as external debt. What is internal debt? Suppose the government of India issues treasury bills. The government of India issues government bonds and raises capital. The government of India would have to return the money to the people because those people who bought the bond paid some price for it and the government of India has to return it. So that is called as liability of the government of India. So whenever government of India borrows from the public within India, that is called as internal debt. When the government of India gets resources or money from agencies like World Bank, Asian Development Bank, because they are outside India. So that is called as external debt. You know, similarly, there is something called as public accounts. What is public accounts? So, for example, National Small Saving Fund. So, if you go to post office and if you buy a National Small Saving Fund, that is basically a way in which we can save some money. So, the, the money that the government gets through National Small Saving Fund or Provident Fund, all these money, this is kept in the public accounts of the government of India. Now, this is the money of the public which the government has to return. Government is only a caretaker of that money. But suppose government takes out some money, some cash from the you know, public accounts of the government and uses it. The government has to return that cash to the public accounts because that money will have to be returned to the public finally. All right. So, so whenever the government of India takes out some cash from public accounts, that is also a liability which the government has to return because that public account consists of funds like National Small Saving Fund, Provident Fund, which belongs to people. So basically, total liability of the central government comprises of these two. Now, if somebody would ask you, what are some of the features of India's public debt? All right. So what are the features of India's public debt? So India's public debt is said to be stable and sustainable. When would the public debt be sustainable? If our internal debt is more than our external debt, because if you borrow too much from outside India and if you are not able to return it on time, so that could be a problem, right? So our internal debt is more than external debt. Similarly, our public debt is greater than other liabilities. So this, this is basically a feature, right? Now, our debts are low risk. When would a debt be risky? See, if you borrow for short term, like six months, one year, etc. Or, or if you borrow for three months, if you borrow for, for example, one month, so you will have to return the money very fast. And suppose you are not able to return it, then there is a risk that some action might be taken against you. So whenever government of India takes debt, it is generally the case that government of India tries to take debt for longer period of time rather than short period of time. Similarly, the government of India tries to take more internal debt rather than external debt. So see, our external debt is low. Our external debt is long term or concessional. We take external debt and we pay low rate of interest and it is long term. Similarly, our internal debt is also mostly long term. These are the features of our debt.
Now, if you look at the trend in India's debt to GDP ratio, see, if you look at the debt to GDP ratio, it was very stable here, right, isn't it? In this phase, 2008 to 2018, 19, it was pretty stable here. Then from 2018, 19 onwards, see how it has started to jump, 2019, 20, see it jumped and 2021, 2020-21 it jumped to 59.3 it's huge jump <clears throat> in our debt to gdp ratio during covid period this has to be controlled now let's look at the finances of the state governments if you look at the state government similar picture if you look at the gross fiscal deficit of the state government see 2019 22.6 then 4.6 and 3.7 so yes it has started to come down if you look at the revenue deficit of the state government it has started to come down and if you look at debt to gdp ratio this is slightly higher it increased after covid and it remained very high so if you look at the combined debt to gdp ratio of state and central government it's huge it must be controlled so guys, now let us try to understand what is the borrowing level by the state governments in India, especially in the context of COVID. You see, who decides what should be the ideal borrowings by the state governments? So it is decided by fiscal responsibility legislation. Now, during COVID, the revenue of both the central and the state government was less than the expenditure. Expenditure was quite huge, especially because of health expenditure and welfare schemes. Now, central government provided some relaxation to the state government and central government told the state government that we are going to increase your borrowing limits. So, the first step taken by central government was to create a new borrowing ceiling for the state government. Now, the state governments have been allowed to borrow up to 4% of their gross state domestic product. So whatever is the gross state domestic product, which means income of the state, so they can borrow up to 4% of that. Now out of this 4%, 3.5% of their gross state domestic product is normal borrowing, but that 0.5%, so out of 4%, 0.5% of gross state domestic product, this would be given to the state government only if the state government would prove that they have indulged in capital expenditure, which means they have created some kind of asset in their state, specifically if they have undertaken some reforms related to power sector. So I'll repeat for you, central government told the state government that the state governments can borrow up to 4% of their gross state domestic product. Out of this 4%, 0.5% borrowings will be given to the state government only if they prove that they have increased their capital expenditure and specifically in the power sector. Other than this, the GST collection during COVID came down. When the GST collection was down, the compensation needs to be given to the state governments. So the central government has marked rupees 1.59 lakh crores as a special borrowing you know which has been allowed for the state governments to compensate them for gst shortfall now the central government has also started a scheme to provide help to the state government to increase capital expenditure in the state so that state governments can create more assets so for northeast states the government of india has announced 2600 crore rupees for all other states 7400 crore and to give incentive to the state governments for privatization disinvestment and monetization of state public sector enterprises the central government has marked 5000 crore rupees for that so these are the helps that the central government is giving to the state government now you know in addition to this the transfer of resources from centers to state happens based on the recommendation of finance commission so 15th finance commission has recommended that the central government should give grant in aid to the state government in the following cases so see 15th finance commission recommended grant in aid to state you know during 2021 22 for the following purposes now the first type of grant is called post devolution revenue deficit grant what is this according to article 275 of the constitution you know that 
the entire tax collection of India, whatever tax we collect, from that, a small part of it is given to the state governments and rest is kept by the central government. Now, if the tax which is given to the state government as their share of taxes, if that is not sufficient for them to carry on their you know, functions for the state government, then it is the duty of the center under Article 275 to provide extra support to the state government. And that extra support is called post-devolution revenue deficit grant. All right. Now, for the year 21-22, according to the Finance Commission, Rupees 1.18 lakh crore must be given to 17 states so that their shortfall in, in revenue can be met. You know, and so far out of this target of 1.18 lakh crore, 98,710 crore has been released already. Another type of transfer is called as grant to local bodies. It is given at two levels. So first we understood uh, this is called as post devolution revenue deficit grant see this is the first one now we are going to do grants to local bodies then we will do health sector grant and next is disaster management grant so see grant to local bodies local bodies are of two types first is urban local bodies rural local bodies right urban local bodies has been divided into two categories first is called category one so those cities where the population is more than 1 million is category one and those cities where the population is less than 1 million is category 2. Now, Government of India gives grants to urban local bodies and rural local bodies in different way. So, if you look at category 1 cities, cities where the population is more than 1 million, 100% grant is given based on the performance of those cities. So, if the cities if the cities are taking care of the citizens and providing basic amenities to people etc so only then that grant will be given and for category 2 cities and rural local bodies you know out of the total grant suppose central government is giving 100 rupees to category 2 and rural local bodies so out of 100 rupees 60 rupees which means 60 percent of the grant will be given only if Two steps are taken by category two cities as well as rural local bodies. What are those two things? The category two cities and rural local bodies must provide sanitation and solid waste management facility and second is drinking water, rainwater harvesting and water recycling. Only if they fulfill these two criteria, then 60% of the grant will be given. All right. So out of 100 rupees grant which suppose category 2 cities and rural local bodies are supposed to get 40 rupees is normal but 60 rupees will be given only if they fulfill these two criteria. and for category 1 cities entire grant that they are supposed to get will be given only if they show that they have performed on the selected parameters of development now guys let us try to understand what is the expenditure policy of government of india especially in the context of covid you see, merely spending money is not important. The most important thing is where we are spending the money and what we are going to get out of it. And especially when it comes to public money. Now, if you look at the expenditure policy of government of India, in the initial COVID phase, the government of India was spending money on essential activities. For example, related to healthcare, related to food, right? Now, in the later COVID phase, the government of India has been spending cash on welfare schemes. Plus, this second part is important. The government of India is spending money on sectors with potential to increase GDP. And we have launched so many new schemes to promote GDP. We have launched schemes related to production, linked incentive, food processing industry, etc. Right? Why is the government of India trying to increase expenditure on those sectors which will increase our GDP? Because government of India feels that if we spend money on infrastructure, if we spend money on manufacturing, MSMEs, two things will happen. GDP will, GDP will increase plus employment will also be created. Because of that, we are spending money on those sectors which have high potential to increase our GDP. 
बट हाउ डू यू फाइंड द क्वालिटी ऑफ एक्सपेंडिचर इफ समबडी वुड आस्क यू अ क्वेश्चन दैट गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इज स्पेंडिंग हंड्रेड रुपीज सपोज हाउ डू यू नो दैट हंड्रेड रुपीज इज क्वालिटी एक्सपेंडिचर गुड एक्सपेंडिचर सो टू फाइंड आउट वेदर द एक्सपेंडिचर इज गुड और नॉट वी कैन डिवाइड एक्सपेंडिचर इन टू टू पार्ट कैपिटल एक्सपेंडिचर एंड रेवेन्यू एक्सपेंडिचर सी रेवेन्यू एक्सपेंडिचर इज एक्सपेंडिचर ऑन डे टू डे थिंग्स लाइक इफ गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया गिव्स मोर सैलरी पेंशन वेजेस एक्सेट्रा राइट और और इट कुड बी कैपिटल एक्सपेंडिचर फॉर एग्जाम्पल क्रिएशन ऑफ यू नो एसेट्स यू नो creating more buildings creating more hospitals school roads etc this is capital expenditure which expenditure should be more capital expenditure so see out of total expenditure so suppose government of india is spending 100 rupees out of that 15.9% is currently the capital expenditure and if you look at the revenue expenditure it's very less less or very low or it's around 12 now you see how our capital expenditure came down during covid how it was down and now it has started to pick up it's almost 16% right and i think this trend should continue you know when a crisis like situation which is covid or any other economic crisis comes the governments of different countries they have certain responsibilities which they have to fulfill for example they have to provide welfare to the society they have to give services like health education policing law and order etc for that you need cash for that you need resources so the government of india also looks for new and innovative ways to raise more money from different sources now one of the schemes that the government of india had started is uh, you know to improve its borrowing is called as retail direct schemes 2021 similarly we will also study that whenever government of india spends money since they are spending public money we want to make sure that the government of india is not over spending right if government of india is trying to buy this digital board government of india must make sure that they are paying the correct price for it and they are not paying very high price so how does government ensure that through this gem right now similarly we have a reform in project management also which we will study so there are basically three schemes and reforms that we are going to study the first one is called retail direct scheme which will help us to understand how government of india is going to borrow more from public you know the government of india has said that the retail investors retail investor means those investors who invest a small amount so retail investors can also invest in government securities through this scheme and how can they do that a retail investor has to open retail direct gilt account and where do you open this account you open this account on a portal which is maintained by rbi now once this account is opened by a retail investor retail investor can invest from 10000 rupees to maximum 2 crore rupees in buying the government securities now the retail investor can operate in both primary market where new securities are bought and sold and secondary market where already existing government securities are bought and sold if the retail investor wants to participate in the secondary market then the retail investor will have to use this platform of rbi called as negotiated dealing system order matching this is rbi's platform for secondary market operation of government securities why has government started this retail direct scheme because government did not want to rely only on some institutions like you know banks or other financial institutions who were buying government securities government wanted that there should be other investors also who should buy government securities so that government can get more cash now <clears throat> we are going to study something called as government e marketplace look at the word e market e market means online market so i'll give you an example now suppose government of india wants to buy regular things like this digital board or table or chair etc etc these are normal items of day to day use if government agencies were buying these items the supplier of these items they were charging very high prices because they knew that government would pay for it and there used to be corruption also so the government of india has now started this platform online platform called as government e marketplace and under the general financial rule 2017 it is compulsory for the government ministries and departments that if a particular item is available on the government e marketplace platform online platform then the government has to compulsorily buy that item from that platform 
because the prices on that platform are the most competitive prices. It has been found out through a research that when the government buys from that platform, which is meant for the government only, so when they buy from that platform, on an average, government pays 15 to 20 percent less price compared to what they would have paid had the government bought it from open market. In fact, in many cases, it has been seen that the government plays pays up to 56% lesser prices on the same product. So earlier government was paying suppose 100 rupees for an item. Now the government is paying only 40 rupees for an item. All right, so government is saving a lot of money through this platform. Now, if the government of India is buying small items, like for example, let's say this digital board or chair or table. So government e-marketplace is a good platform, but sometimes the government of India does not require a small item. Sometimes the government of India requires big consultancy for big projects. The government of India wants to construct roads. The government of India wants to construct big buildings. In that case, the government of India takes the help of those people who can help the government with providing consultancy services or who can help the government in constructing buildings, etc. But how does the government select who will help the government of India to give consultancy or who will help the government to construct roads. So for that, basically the government of India so far has been using central public procurement portal. So for those items which are not normal, which involves a lot of technology, which involves consultancy, government uses this portal. And government of India, according to general finance rules, you know, According to General Financial Rules 2017, the government of India uses three methods to select who will provide services to the government or who will help the government in different projects. How does the government select the parties? Through least cost system. A second system is called quality come cost based selection. Third is called single source selection. What are these? So suppose government of India wants to construct a road. All right. Now, the government of India used to ask this question that does anyone want to help the government to construct a road? So there would be many people who would say yes. Then the government of India would put some basic technical qualification that, you know, you should have a team of engineers, civil engineer, etc, etc. And we will allow you to construct roads. So government used to put very small minimum conditions, technical conditions. And the government used to ask how much money would you take to construct a road? And the party which used to quote the least amount, that is why it is called least cost system. So suppose I tell the government that I can construct the road in 1 lakh rupees. Others are saying 12 lakh rupees. So government will give the contract to me. So here the priority of the government was to give the contract to somebody who would charge lesser prices. Rather than technicalities, the focus was on less cost. This is good for general purposes. But if the project involves a lot of technology, innovation, big projects, this is not a good system because it does not make selections based on technical expertise of the service provider. It makes selection based on least cost quoted, right? Similarly, <clears throat> let's, let's look at quality come cost based selection. So basically when the government of India required the help of some consultants, for some projects. The government of India used to have this formula where government used to say that the person should be technically sound and second that person you know should have um, you know quoted the least amount. So the person should charge less fee plus the person should have technical expertise also. Both the factors were taken into consideration and this formula quality come cost based selection this was basically used to, to hire consultants for the government. It was not used for non-consultancy kind of work. For that, least cost system was used. Now, single source selection, if the government of India, for example, wanted to construct roads, the government of India used to say that anybody, uh, you know, wants to construct road, please apply. Suppose five parties are applying. Government used to end up selecting the same party which had given services to the government earlier. Government used to say that since they have given us the services earlier, we know how they work. So the government used to prefer those parties which have earlier worked with government of India or those who have better experience. So that is called as single source selection. Now some changes have happened recently in these and, and these changes are important. For example, the biggest change that has happened is in quality come cost based selection. 
earlier this was used only for selection of consultancy services for the government so government of india used to hire consultants based on this formula where both quality and cost was important but now the government of india has started to use this quality and cost combination to hire you know parties which will help the government of india also for construction of roads hospital which means both for consultancy and non consultancy government is hiring their services the second change that has happened in these kind of uh, you know models is that according to general financial rule 2017 these three were used earlier now the government has made some reforms and said that now based on the requirement of the project government can make modifications in all these three earlier these three were rigid now the new developments according to new change the government has the power to make modifications in these models also so guys this completes our second chapter which is the chapter on fiscal developments in india from the current economic survey now we are going to move on to the next chapter so now guys let us start this topic called as monetary management and financial intermediation now before we understand the details of this topic from economic survey let us have a look at some of the generic monetary developments in india so you see this table i have taken from the survey it will give a very good idea about what has been the repo rate of india reverse repo rate cash reserve ratio statutory liquidity ratio and marginal standing facility so guys now let us understand in in very brief uh the meaning of all these ratios you know the first one is called as repo rate what is repo rate the rate at which rbi gives loan to other banks what is reverse repo rate reverse repo rate is the rate at which the scheduled commercial banks of india they put their cash with rbi and rbi pays them this interest rate crr and slr these are the two mandatory requirements that all the banks of india they have to fulfill rbi has mandated that the banks have to maintain crr and slr for two purposes one is to ensure safety of the banks so that they don't overlend and number two to maintain liquidity and control inflation so whenever rbi feels inflation has to be controlled rbi might increase crr and slr <clears throat> similarly to control liquidity rbi might increase crr and slr in that case the liquidity available in the economy will come down what is marginal standing facility if the banks are in acute or emergency need of fund for very short term purposes then they can borrow at this rate called as marginal standing facility so you know if you look carefully you will see two things here that in the initial phases of covid around mid 2019 till 2021 till till initial parts of 2020 2021 you will see that rbi was reducing the repo rate reverse repo rate crr slr msf to increase liquidity in the economy but if you if you look at around the you know 2021 uh, after march 2021 you would see that crr has started to increase which means that around the second half of of 2021 the reserve bank of india somehow wanted to control liquidity in the economy so initially when the covid started reserve bank of india wanted to push more liquidity in the economy but later on the reserve bank of india wanted to control liquidity these are the two things that we can get out of this table now if you look at <clears throat> liquidity management we can divide it into two categories number 1 liquidity easing so around mid 2019 to initial 2021 the reserve bank of india was following expansionary monetary policy where they were pushing more liquidity in the economy and later on the reserve bank of india followed you know contractionary monetary policy which is liquidity tightening you know how did these two things happen so see this is what we just studied that there was surplus liquidity in the economy mid 20, 2019 and initial phases of 2021 and then later on in 2021 the reserve bank of india started to control liquidity through reverse repo by increasing crr and through something called as variable rate reverse repo so you know what did what did rbi do the reserve bank of india i told you that suppose i am a commercial bank and i want to 
put my money with Reserve Bank of India. What does the Reserve Bank of India do? The Reserve Bank of India provides me an interest rate called as reverse repo. So initially, <clears throat> the reverse repo in India was 4.9% for it, it came down to 3.35 and it remained fixed. So if I am a scheduled commercial bank, I am HDFC bank suppose, if I put my money with Reserve Bank of India, Reserve Bank of India will give me an interest rate of 3.35%. Now Reserve Bank of India created a new policy called as variable reverse repo. All right, variable rate reverse repo. Under it, the Reserve Bank of India offered to the banks that if they would put their money with Reserve Bank of India, Reserve Bank of India would give them a higher interest rate, which will be higher than the reverse repo. So if reverse repo is 3.35%, for example, RBI would offer them 3.5, 3.4, so that more banks would put their money with Reserve Bank of India and liquidity in the economy would come down. So these are some of the innovative steps that Reserve Bank of India followed. But remember one thing. Even during liquidity tightening phase, the Reserve Bank of India made sure that there is so much of liquidity and money supply in the economy that GDP is not impacted. All right, So that is what we have written here. Now, what are the steps that Reserve Bank of India took to promote liquidity in this phase? See, mid-2019 and initial phase of 2021, some of the steps taken by RBI to pump liquidity in the economy. So Reserve Bank of India pumped 25,000 crore to NABAR, 10,000 crore to National Housing Bank, 31,000 crore to Small Industries Development Bank. Similarly, 50,000 crore was given by Reserve Bank of India for the purpose of health infrastructure creation. So anybody who wanted to take loan for health infrastructure creation, etc. could take money from this 50,000 crore. Similarly, the Reserve Bank of India followed special long-term repo operation. You know, what is special long-term repo operation? So the Reserve Bank of India provided 10,000 crore to support MSMEs and unorganized sector. So suppose I am a bank, all right, and I am interested in giving loan to MSMEs. I'm interested in giving loan to unorganized sector, but I don't have cash. So I can take money from Reserve Bank of India and what is the interest rate that I have to pay to the Reserve Bank of India? Only the repo rate. For example, 4% is the repo rate, so I will pay 4%. And I can give that money to MSMEs or I can give that money to unorganized sector at less or lower rate of interest. This is that scheme. Now, similarly, the Reserve Bank of India started a program called as Government Securities Acquisition Program, GSAP. What happens under this program? So let me explain. You know, in fact, Reserve Bank of India has given a very nice name to it. Reserve Bank of India calls this uh, GSAP program as open market operation with a distinct character, which means it's a large scale open market operation. What is the meaning of this and what happens? Under GSAP program, look at this carefully, please. Under GSAP program, the Reserve Bank of India buys government securities when the Reserve Bank of India would buy government securities, more liquidity would be pumped in the economy, right? Now, when the government of India would buy government securities, see, money supply in the economy goes up, people have more cash, but there is something more which is happening, which is very, very interesting. Now, when the government of India buys the government security, what would happen? The demand of government securities would increase in the economy because government is demanding more government securities. RBI is demanding more government securities. So the demand for securities would go up. Whenever demand for something goes up, what happens to the price? Its price also goes up. Now bond price will increase. When bond price increases, we know through this formula of bond yield, bond yield is equal to coupon rate, by bond price. If bond price goes up, bond yield will come down. When the bond yield will come down in future, it will become very easy for government of India to borrow. See, currently government of India was buying government securities through RBI. Government of India was buying government securities and RBI was releasing cash. Now, because of this operation, large scale operation, when a lot of cash came in the economy, through this mechanism, you saw that the yield, bond yield came down. When the bond yield comes down, it becomes easy for the government of India to borrow at cheaper rates. 
सो नाउ द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया बोरोइंग रेट्स वुड कम डाउन राइट कॉस्ट ऑफ बोरोइंग वुड कम डाउन इन फ्यूचर सो इफ गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया वुड ट्राई टू गेट मोर मनी फ्रॉम पब्लिक इट वुड बी बिकॉज द बॉन्ड इल्ड इज लो सो गाइज नाउ लेट एस ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड सम ऑफ द बेसिक रेशियोज विच आर वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फ्रॉम प्रेलिम्स परस्पेक्टिव एंड दे आर ऑल रिलेटेड टू बैंकिंग सेक्टर नाउ सपोज दिस इज अ बैंक दिस बैंक हैज गिवन हंड्रेड रुपीज टू दिस पर्सन एज अ लोन ऑल राइट सो दिस इज अ लोन विच हैज बिन गिवन टू दिस पर्सन तो दिस पर्सन इज सपोज टू रिटर्न दिस दिस मनी हंड्रेड रुपीज प्लस सपोज द रेट ऑफ इंटरेस्ट दैट दिस पर्सन हैज टू पे सेवन परसेंट सो दिस पर्सन हैज टू रिटर्न बोथ दिस प्रिंसिपल एंड रेट ऑफ इंटरेस्ट बट सपोज फॉर सम रीजन बिकॉज ऑफ कोविड और सम काइंड ऑफ सिचुएशन दिस पर्सन इज नॉट एबल टू रिटर्न आइदर सेवन परसेंट इंटरेस्ट नॉर हंड्रेड रुपीज और राइट सो आइदर प्रिंसिपल और इंटरेस्ट और ई एम आई दिस पर्सन इज नॉट एबल टू रिटर्न द कैश फॉर नाइनटी डेज when you are not able to return the you know emi installments or interest rate or principal of a bank that is called as non performing asset npa so he is not the only person who is unable to return the cash of the bank loan of the bank there are so many people who are not able to return the cash of the bank right so if you add all these loans that these people have taken which they are unable to return that is called as gross npa gross non performing asset now suppose this this person gets 100 rupees loan from the bank and bank out of its income keeps 20 rupees separately with itself so that in future if this person is not able to return the money at least the bank has some kind of safety net which the bank can use to survive so suppose every time the bank gives 100 rupees loan the bank keeps 20 rupees separately as a safety net so that if something wrong happens in the future bank can use this money to survive so that bank doesn't become bankrupt so this 20 rupees which the bank keeps separately after giving loan is called as provisioning so when we subtract this 20 rupees which means provisioning from gross npa if you subtract pro- from gross npa subtract the provisioning amount so from 100 you subtract 20 rupees you get 80 rupees this is called as net npa this net npa gives the real picture of the problem that the bank is facing now in some situations it also happens guys that suppose there is this person this is a different person suppose this person also has taken 100 rupees as a loan from this bank for one year and this person is not able to return the money now during covid it happened with many people so in that case the reserve bank of india might bring a scheme where the reserve bank of india might say that okay don't worry you should increase the time period of of the loan don't force this person to return the money in one year ask him to return the money in two years and also reduce his interest rate to 5% from 7% reduce it to 5% this is called as restructured loan or restructured asset or no it will not be called as non performing asset because rbi has asked the bank to do this it is restructured loan so we have a new term called as a stressed advance all right this is a new term it is called as a stressed advance what is a stressed advance a stressed advance takes into account restructured assets or restructured loans like this plus npa plus this npa so if you take both the things together it is called as stressed advance it gives you an idea about the trouble that the banks are facing all right now having seen all these ratios let us try to understand what is the actual trend in uh, gross npa net npa and all these ratios of the indian banking sector so guys let us have a look at the health of public sector banks private banks and overall scheduled commercial banks so if you look at the gross npa it has come down in all the banks now if you look at net npa it has come down but if you look at restructured advances remember i told you that rate of interest is reduced time period is increased so restructured standard advances it has increased right similarly if you look at the stressed advances stressed stressed advance ratio comprises of both restructured advances plus npa so since npa has come down but restructured advances have gone up 
hence the stressed advances have gone up see and then you have CRAR what is CRAR so CRAR talks about the capital of a bank the capital that a bank has compared the overall capital that the bank has compared to its risk weighted assets so it has actually improved compared to risk weighted assets the overall capital that the bank has it has this ratio has gone up now what is ROE so and then there is a term called ROA so let me explain this to you see ROE and ROA return on equity and return on asset both have increased for the banking system let me explain what these two are so you see return on asset means that suppose guys I am a company I'm a company specifically suppose I am a bank now suppose I have given loan loan is an asset for me on that loan what is the profit that I am making so what what is the profit that a bank makes on a loan interest rate so if I am getting regularly the interest rate and high interest rate so my rate return on asset is very high and for Indian banking it is good currently what is return on equity suppose I am a company now I have sold shares in the market so suppose the price of my share was one rupee so when I sell shares in the market I will get one rupee using that one rupee if I am a company how much profit am I able to generate that is called as return on equity so using the one rupee which I got by selling shares if I can generate a profit of 10 paisa that's good if I can generate a profit of 20 paisa that's even better that is called return on equity all right so for Indian banking system the the return on equity and return on assets have been good they have increased now having looked at different ratios in the banking system now let us look at the bank credit growth so you know bank provides credit to different sectors so let us see in the context of covid if there has been any growth in the bank credit so see if you look at this picture you will see that around 2018-19 bank was provide a lot of credit in the economy but during covid it came down and now it has started to pick up so finally the bank credit is growing which means banks are giving more credit to different sectors in the economy now which are the sectors and what are the trends of bank credit growth so see trend in credit growth since 2019 the bank credit growth in India was coming down which means different sectors were not taking money from bank and in fact banks were also suffering from NPA problem but since December 2021 because of you know the lockdown getting over etc you see that there has been sharp increase in the bank credit growth and many sectors of the economy they are taking more bank loans and credit from the bank example non-food bank credit agriculture msme and personal loan especially vehicle loan so here people are taking a lot of loans because of which the bank credit has increased there are two areas of concern where the bank credit has not increased first is large industries and second is service sector so here the bank credit growth has not happened to the extent that we wanted so now guys let us have a look at the non-banking financial companies nbfc credit growth you know nbfc's are very very important because they provide a lot of credit specially to msme sector so credit growth of nbfc's were majorly sluggish you know in 2021 22 which means a lot of credit was not being provided by NBFCs in the economy it also shows that there was economic slowdown which was because of the COVID situation but from March 2021 to September we see slight increase in the credit provided by NBFC see slight improvement so that's a good sign for the economy now which are the top recipients of NBFC credit which sectors take a lot of money from NBFCs, our industries, then retail loans, services, non-food and agriculture and allied. These are the top recipients of money from NBFCs. Now, if you look at the health of NBFC, I, I taught you uh, GNPA, gross NPA, net NPA and CRAR. So if you look at the gross NPA, 6.665, it has increased, which means people have not returned the money of NBFCs. NNNPA static it has remained almost at the same level and CRAR 
Reserve Bank of India says that the NBFC should maintain the CRAR of 15% which means capital to risk weighted ratio 15% but currently they are maintaining 26.64 which means they are in a healthy condition compared to risky capital the, the total capital that they have is very high so it's good for them right now guys one of the important things and very interesting thing that I found in this uh, ES economic survey in chapter number four is called as national asset reconstruction company and Indian debt resolution company now these two were announced in the last year's budget now this year's economic survey says that important steps have been taken towards the implementation of these two so what is this idea suppose this is a bank this bank has given a loan to this person suppose the loan amount is 100 rupees just to keep the story simple suppose the loan amount is 100 rupees but this person is unable to return the money now what this bank can do is this bank will call this as a problematic asset why because the bank gave loan and bank is expecting that the money will be returned back to the bank but bank is not getting it so what the bank can do is government of india has established national asset reconstruction company narcl limited now what is narcl going to do narcl is going to buy this loan document from the bank so suppose in this document it is written that this person is supposed to pay back 100 rupees to the bank so this document will be bought by narcl now there is indian debt resolution company limited idrcl so idrcl is going to create a plan about how to recover this money and what to do with this paper so this paper will be bought by narcl then idrcl is going to create a plan and find out if there is anybody in the economy who is interested in buying this so look at this paper so is there anybody who is interested in buying this paper there are investors who invest in risky things so for example suppose this guy is interested in buying this paper this is a small system which I, which is being created in india for the resolution of these stressed asset problem the fine details of how it works and what will actually happen will be you know clear to us as and when the system starts to develop more now what is national asset reconstruction company the national asset reconstruction company will be you know 51 percent it will be owned by public sector banks so the banks of india both public and private sector banks they are going to create this in fact this is the idea of the government that the government of india said that this body will be totally owned by the banks and the 51 percent ownership will be with the public sector banks and rest with private banks idrcl private banks will have 51 percent ownership and rest will be the ownership of the public sector banks now guys let me explain a concept which is given in the economic survey which is called as factoring after that i'll tell you why the economic survey discusses this concept in this year's edition what is factoring you know let's take the example of an msme suppose msme is producing some goods and that good has been sold to this customer this customer is the buyer and msme is the seller suppose the price of the good which the msme has sold is for example 100 rupees now the msme will write this on a piece of paper called as invoice now this person suppose is sub is, is is expected to make the payment maybe after a week so what this msme can do is the msme takes that piece of paper called invoice and msme sells the invoice to a bank or nbfc now this bank or nbfc will make the payment to the msme so suppose the invoice amount is 100 rupees so this bank or nbfc will give 100 rupees to msme after deducting you know some charges now this bank and nbfcs are going to recover this 100 rupees from this buyer right so of course they they collect from you know they these nbfcs and bank they collect the amount from the buyer and they keep some commission also in this entire process now these banks and nbfcs are called as factors 
all right technically they are called as factors and this mechanism is called as factoring this factoring is very important especially for msmes who need quick payments because when they sell their goods they need quick payments sometimes they are not able to get it so they resort to factoring in india only those nbfcs were allowed to indulge in factoring whose principal business which means whose main business used to be factoring so if these nbfcs are earning more than 50% of their income through factoring then only we used to say that their principal business is factoring so hardly seven nbfcs were allowed to do it in india because they fulfilled the criteria in the year you know 2019 government of india appointed uk sinha committee the uk sinha committee was appointed to make some reforms in msme sector one of the suggestions by uk sinha committee was that government should remove this restriction that only those nbfcs should be allowed to become factors whose principal business is factoring and make it open for any nbfc which can become a factor government of india implemented it and made some changes in the factoring in india the rules of factoring and currently the economic services that now any nbfc can give this services called as factoring services and that restrictive condition of uh, the nbfc whose principal business is factoring so that restrictive condition has been removed guys now i'm going to tell you something very interesting which has been given in the economic survey it is related to deposit insurance in india now have a look at these pictures please see this is pmc bank punjab and maharashtra cooperative bank look at this second bank this is lakshmi vilas uh, bank and this is the third bank which is yes bank what is common between these why do you see so many people standing in front of the bank you see there are situations when bank lands in trouble when a bank can also become bankrupt right in that situation if you have deposited money in this bank if your cash is there with the bank how would you feel if the bank doesn't return your cash right so to to do away with these problems the government of india has a system what is the system so the system is that that there is this fully owned subsidiary of rbi reserve bank of india owns this it is called as deposit insurance and credit guarantee corporation now what is the job of this now the moment a bank gets a license in india automatically deposit insurance and credit guarantee corporation dicgc it gives insurance to the bank automatically the bank becomes insured and the bank has to provide a premium to dicgc now these things happen according to dicgc act 1961 and dicgc general regulation 1961 so the moment a bank gets a license in india the bank becomes insured by dicgc and the bank has to provide a premium to dicgc and what is the meaning of that premium the meaning of that premium is that if suppose depositors have deposited money in a bank like for example yes bank and if there is a problem in this bank and the government of india is trying to resolve the issue government of india is trying to make things right in the bank but in that duration when the banking is you know being brought to normal situation by the government what would people do who have deposited cash so from that insured amount the premium which the bank has paid to dicgc when they got the license from that amount money is given to people who are the depositors in the bank earlier in india you know the government of india used to provide in 1961 whatever money you deposit with the bank but only 1500 rupee was your insured money which means if something wrong happens in the bank the bank would provide you 1500 rupees in 1980 this amount was increased to 30000 <clears throat> in 1993 to 1 lakh and 2021 the government of india has increased this to 5 lakh which means if something goes wrong in the bank today and if you have deposited cash there so at least your 5 lakh rupees is insured and you will definitely get that 5 lakh rupees within 90 days of the bank falling in trouble it doesn't matter whether the government has been able to sort out the problems of the bank but within 90 days of the bank falling in trouble the people who have deposited money they can get maximum up to 5 lakh rupees all right this is the new change that has happened under deposit insurance and credit guarantee corporation amendment act 2021 
So guys, in this economic survey, in chapter number four, there is one more interesting thing which has been mentioned. It is called as pre-packaged insolvency resolution process for corporates, corporate MSMEs. Now, what is the meaning of insolvency? So for example, suppose that there is a company like this. This company has taken money from this person. This person is called as creditor and this company is called as debtor. This person is not able to this company is not able to return the money of the creditor. This creditor could be an individual, it could be a bank. So if the company is not able to return the money, then the assets of the company like factory, machine, etc. has to be sold and whatever is recovered, the money will be returned to this creditor. This entire process of selling the asset and you know trying to recover money, etc. is done through a system called as insolvency and bankruptcy code. right? Now in this economic survey, it has been mentioned that there, there is a new system of insolvency and bankruptcy code in India now. It is called as pre-packaged insolvency resolution process for corporate MSMEs. So for MSMEs, suppose an MSME has taken money from a bank or a creditor and it is not able to return it. And if the insolvency process starts, it involves so many agents in between, insolvency professional, courts, etc that if the process drags on for very long, then it becomes a problem for MSME. For big companies, they can manage, but for MSMEs, there is a problem. So in India, we have a new solution for it called as PPIRP, this system whereby if suppose an MSME has taken money from this creditor and but the MSME is not able to return the cash, this MSME will then submit a resolution plan that okay, how am I going to sell my machine, factory, recover cash and give it to this guy. During that period, when the MSME is trying to sell its machine and factories and recover cash, in that period, this MSME will be managed by board of directors. Now this creditor, because he has given to money to the MSME, this creditor has the right to make changes in this plan. Because ultimately, whatever plan has been given to sell the factory or machine, this creditor is going to get money out of it. So if the creditor feels some new changes can be made in the plan, he can propose the changes so that maximum money can be received by selling the asset of the company. So which means that resolution will happen under his guidance. So here there is minimum role of courts or insolvency professionals and the biggest role is played by this and this. This because the company has taken the debt loan and creditor because he has given cash. It is their understanding which plays a more important role. It's a very flexible process. This has been suggested so that you know undue time and cost which is involved in insolvency can be reduced. Right? Similarly, there is one more suggestion in this economic survey. This economic survey says that suppose there is a factory in India like this company and they have taken money from investors of different countries and suppose this Indian company is not able to return the money. So now how are we going to sell the assets? How are we going to make the plan so that we can return the money of investors of different countries? So our insolvency and bankruptcy code which we follow in India, it does not have a specific provisions in case some Indian company has taken money from multiple countries. So this economic survey says that we must find a mechanism to do that. One of the suggested mechanism by this year's economic survey is as follows. So guys, there is this United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. It is being followed by approximately more than 49 countries today. It was established in 1997. This precisely provides a framework so that if a company in a particular country has raised money from different countries and if the company is not able to return the cash then how to go about insolvency process how to recover the cash so the insolvency law committee which was established in india in 2018 they have suggested that india can also adopt this uncitral all right so because many countries of the world are following the same thing we can make suitable changes in it and adopt it in India. So guys, I'm sure you must have heard about Bombay Stock Exchange, BSE Sensex 30, NSE Nifty 50. These are all called as stock market index. 
Now Morgan Stanley Capital International Emerging Market Index, this has been given in this year's economic survey. What is this index? You know, to create this index, we go to 25 emerging market economies. After traveling there, we take up some of the best listed companies from these 25 emerging market economies. For example, we go to Brazil, China, India, etc. South Korea and we take some of the best companies from these countries. We put them in this box and we track the price of their equity and how they perform. So this index has currently 1420 listed companies and from India also companies have been put here. What is the importance of India? So out of these 1420 companies, what is the weight of India? The weightage of India is 12.45%. So this is the contribution of India in this, in this index. So what is the importance of Brazil? Weightage of Brazil, what is 3.99% and weightage of South Korea, 12.81%. What is the weightage of China? Chinese weight is more than 30%. <clears throat> so if the weight of a country is high in this index, called as Morgan Stanley Capital International Emerging Market Index. If the weight of a country is high, that means more companies from that country has been represented here, then it helps us to attract more foreign investors. Initially, the weight of India was 6%, 7%, 8%. Now it is 12.45%, so it is increasing. So the economic survey says that government of India has liberalized our foreign investment policy to attract more foreign investors and government of India is also taking steps to boost our performance of the Indian companies so more companies can be put in this list. So this is one extra information which is given in the economic survey. So with this we complete our series on economic survey analysis for 2021-22. I hope that you are able to use this information to perform well in the exam. All the very best for your preparations and see you with the series next year. Thank you so much.